Welcome to The Naked Entrepreneur. I'm Sean Wise, Professor of Entrepreneurship and Strategy at Ryerson University. Tonight, we're going to get up close and personal with another anchor of the Canadian startup scene. Tonight, I'm joined by students from across campus for our intimate interview with Mark Evans. Mark Evans has been a cornerstone of the tech industry since the late 1990s. After graduating from journalism at Carleton University, he wrote for Bloomberg, The National Post, and The Globe and Mail. After a stint at several startups, including B5 Media and Planet Eye, Mark has returned to being the voice of startups in Canada with his blog for Forbes and his newsletter, This Week in Canadian Startups. Welcome back. I'm joined now by Mark Evans. Mark, thank you for coming. Thanks for inviting me. When I look at your career, I see three major phases. Let's go back to the very, very beginning. You graduate from Carleton. It's the late 90s. The dot-com boom is just starting to edge its way into Canada. How did you decide to be a technology reporter? Um, more by accident, by design. So when I had been in Hong Kong for a couple of years and I had come back, uh, and got a job with the National Post and actually the Financial Post at the time. And um, the managing editor, Tim Pritchard, uh, basically said that I had two choices as far as beats were concerned. One was um, office equipment and the other one was technology. Uh, and were they, they were compared to like apples and oranges. Sort like of. I think almost these two prizes. Were, was technology seen as a prize? Or well, I think he was. I, well, he was setting me up. But, okay. um, but the real story was, um, was that, uh, that I. It was 95 and I, we were talking about who was going to cover this thing called the internet. And, and I got in a, in, a, in a mini sort of fun war with the telecom reporter about who would cover the internet. I lost, so I got to cover the internet. Because at the time it was this thing that no one really knew about and no one really wanted to dig in. So that's how I really got my start, um, which, was, uh, which seems like a long time ago. It does. So, so you've reported for Bloomberg, you've reported for uh, the Globe and Mail, you've reported for the Financial Post, the National Post. In all that time, you've seen hundreds, if not thousands, of startups. How do you like to be pitched? Well, I like to be pitched in English. So I like to be pitched in a way that tells me in a very concise way what you do, um, the value that you provide, uh, potential users, how you're different, how you're unique. And you'd be surprised by how difficult that is for many, many companies, including larger companies. Um, to be able to get that elevator pitch right down, get that hook established, show you the stories there. Right. So the, one of the problems is that you get so immersed in who you are and what you're doing that you have no perspective. And so oftentimes I would, I would be pitched on the uh, phone by, by a company and they would go on for five minutes and then I'd say to them, okay, listen, I've been covering technology for five years or 10 years and I know the vernacular and all the jargon. I have no idea what you guys do. <laughs> so could you explain it to me in English? And then they'd take a step back and go, well, we do this. And I go, exactly. Um, and that's one, of the, that's one of the biggest challenges with, I think with startups in general is that they do a pretty lousy job of, of conveying who they are and why anybody should care. I think a lot of time they're still finding out for themselves what their value proposition and it's still a work in progress. But if all startups are pitching you and only some of them will survive, how do you as a reporter know which ones are worth covering? Well, you're always looking for an angle. I mean, to simply pitch that we make this widget or we do this service is not enough because there's hundreds if not, if not thousands of other companies doing the same thing. So you've got to come up with, with a way that separates you from the pack. So it's, it's something that makes you unique. It's either the, your founder is a certain person with a certain education, with a certain amount of experience, or that you're focused on a particular niche that no one else is really going after, or that you manage to pull in a high profile investor. Whatever makes you, whatever separates you from everybody else, that's what you have to sort of massage and hone um, to so get focus the on the differentiation because you're getting a hundred calls and everyone thinks their startup is the very best startup. Right. I know you watch Dragons Den week after week and you see people who don't see what we see. 
they have this, this bias to their own venture. And I imagine being pitched all the time by people with this bias must get difficult. Why do you decide to pursue one story over another? Is it the reader's interest? Is it, do, you, do you see something in the story? Well, I think, I, think it's, I think I would say it's more my interests than the reader's, but I think my interest reflects the reader's. I'm, as a reporter, I was you know, curious by nature. But you're always, you're trained after looking at you know, thousands of pitches to know what's a story and what's not. And so you're always looking for that little wrinkle um, that you can get, that you can build a story around. Um, you can't build a story around the fact that this company does this thing. That's, that's pretty boring. So do you like it when people pitch you the full story, not only what they do, but why it would be interesting to your readers? Or do you prefer to make that jump yourself? I, I want them to pitch me in a way that is relevant to what I write about, uh, things that I'm interested in, and the audience that they think I'm serving. If, if they do that, then they're showing me that they've done their homework, as opposed to what many companies do is, is the shotgun approach, where they blast out to everybody and they hope that something sticks. So I find with investors they do that too. So instead of spending 50 hours on one investor, they'll spend one hour on 50 investors and hope something sticks. So when people do that to reporters, I imagine it's sort of frustrating. Do you remember any of the best pitches or the worst pitches you heard way back in the dot-com era? Did something stick out for you? I don't know. I mean, um, I would think that, uh, that maybe among the worst was uh, Petopia. Petopia. Which was a online, I guess, service to order pet food. Uh, and it was just an outrageous proposition at the time. Um, and they had a puppet. I think that was the one with the puppet. The dog puppet, right? Dog puppet. Yeah. Uh, it was so unbelievable at the time that somebody would actually, and this is, I think, this is like 19, you know, 1990 or 2000, and it was unbelievable that somebody would ship 50 pounds of dog food. Uh, you have to buy it in such large quantities internet. To, to make it work. But these days, that, it's, entirely, it's entirely doable. People, lots of people do it. But at the time, it seemed really outrageous. I mean, during the original dot-com boom, I mean, where every, everybody thought anything was possible, and if you did anything online to become an instant millionaire, um, you heard all kinds of crazy stuff. Okay. Now, you get through that. You see the dot-com boom and the dot-com bust. And then a few years later, you find yourself in a startup. How did that transition work? How did you go from being part of a large institutional media source to working at a Toronto-based startup like a B5 Media or right. Planet Eye? So I was, uh, I was a tech reporter for the Globe and Mail at the time, uh, for the ROB, and that's like playing for the Yankees. Yeah. Uh, Pretty much. You, know, you work your entire career to work for the Na you know, Canada's national newspaper. And then uh, and all of a sudden, you walk in one day and say, I'm quitting you know, uh, at the height of your career. And what happened is I had a friend of mine who was a lot smarter than, than I am, and that's the key when you work for a startup is actually work for somebody who's smarter than you are and hire people who are smarter than you are. And uh, he said to me, I'm gonna do this, um, I'm gonna start this business and I, and I want you to join me. And I said, sure, yeah, raise some money. And I didn't think he'd be serious. I mean, I liked my job and everything. And he went out and raised money. And so I kind of got caught that I had to actually join him. Uh, so hold on, let's, let's not pass over that. So are we talking about Jeremy Wright and B5 Media? We're no, talking about another a, business. it's a, another business called Blanketware with a friend of mine, Mark Walker. So Mark Walker comes to you and he says, I'm going to leave my position. I'm going to pursue this. Right. And you, who just admitted you were working at the pinnacle, the, the, the top of the top of your career. Right. And you just started and you got a great beat. It's 2000. You're covering wonderful technology. And then you see someone who you consider smarter than yourself. Right. Do this. And that makes you want to join him? After the dot-com boom, you thought, let's go be an entrepreneur? Well, he promised me he'd make me a millionaire. He didn't, he didn't fulfill his promise. Uh, I don't know. You know, it's funny. Um, you know, I think one of the things that a lot of, what happened to a lot of tech reporters at that time is they got seduced by this whole dot-com phenomenon. A lot of people got seduced by it. Uh, and I I'm, wasn't, certainly wasn't the only tech reporter to sort of go to the dark side. Uh, I think it was a combination. Maybe I was ready. Maybe, uh, maybe I just liked the opportunity. Maybe it was just time for a change. There's lots of reasons why you decide to become an entrepreneur. Some of them are by design. You say to yourself, I want to be an entrepreneur. And some of them are by accident. Um, and in your case, which was it? It was probably by accident. I mean, quasi-accident. Although I probably, it was probably what I wanted to do, but I didn't know it at the time. So you accidentally fell into what you really wanted to do? I think so. What was the draw? Was it just the, the be a billionaire, I could be like Bill Gates, or was there something you weren't liking at the institutional size, working for a big business? I don't know. I mean, I think one of the things when, you, when you're presented with an, an entrepreneurial opportunity, it's not, you don't always make a rational decision. You, you don't always go through the pros and cons and decide, okay, at the end of the day, the pros outweigh the cons, I'm going to do this. It, it's, maybe it's the value of your friendship. Um, you know, Mark Walker is a really smart guy, and he's, he is a dyed-in-the-wool entrepreneur. 
and maybe I saw him as a, as a gateway to becoming an entrepreneur myself. So it seemed like the right thing to do at the right time. Were there any myths that you had that were shattered soon thereafter? Was there, I was going to leave and I wasn't going to have a boss and now I showed up and I got 18 bosses, they're my community demanding my attention. Right. Well, I mean, other than the fact that I was going to become a millionaire, that myth was pretty much busted right away. Um, but I guess the thing was that I thought that my experience and credibility as a reporter would carry on into the, doc, into the startup world. And what I discovered is that the reputation that I had earned as a reporter, a high profile reporter um, in some senses, um, didn't translate. So when I, when I was on the other side trying to pitch reporters about my startup, I didn't get the time of day, even though they knew me and they liked me. I think they liked me. Um, but because I was just another startup pitching them another story and that was a bit of a wake up call. If you could go back now, 10 years later, and talk to the then Mark, would you tell him to leave? Would you tell him to take that chance to join the other Mark to read the paper? Oh yeah, yeah. That Mark would have said in a heartbeat. That's interesting. Now you you spent about four years, five years at startups, but there was a number of startups along the way. When did you decide that Mark might be not be the path for you? That that blanket 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 wear, blanket wear might not be the path for you. So we uh, so what happened after I joined was shortly after I joined the dot com boom went bust. And I fired myself because they didn't need a marketing communications guy. They were still in product development mode. So I went back to the National Post for, for five years as okay. a tech reporter. Um, had an awesome run, mostly writing about how terrible Nortel was and that entire decline of Nortel, which was amazing as a reporter. Remember, we like two types of stories, really good stories and really bad stories. And Nortel was a really bad news story. It was really still going on today. It was great. Uh, and then, uh, and then um, in 2006, I got, a, uh, I got a call from Rick Siegel, who was, a, um, who was with JLA Albright, which a was venture a, capital a venture firm, capital, yep. and said, we've got this blog network called B5 Media. We'd like you to join to be VP operations or VP content. Now, you just spent time back in big business. You went back to big business for a variety of reasons. Right. One of them was stability, cash flow, a need. Right. And now you're thinking about doing it again. Right. Would, did, would you jump just as fast? Uh, yeah, I, I did actually. It was probably easier the second time around um, because I felt more comfortable leaving journalism for a few reasons. One is I, I had started writing a blog, so I had a new outlet. Whereas when I during the dot com boom, there was no such thing as blogs, uh, or blogs weren't mainstream. No, if people wanted to read your writing, they picked up the newspaper. Right. Uh, a second was that I had started to branch out. In, an, in other entrepreneurial directions, like I had started a, a conference called Mesh, which is carrying on today. Uh, I started to be approached by startups to become advisors. Um, so I was starting to sort of develop these outside interests. So when Rick came around and asked me if I had interest in joining a startup, I was ready. Like it was, it was obvious that my interests were starting to change. Did you take anything from the first experience into that? So did you structure it differently? Did you set different expectations? Were you still hoping to be a multimillionaire? Uh, well, you know, money is obviously an incentive. I mean, one of the things about, about startups is that you're all in. And, and if you do a startup, and, you, and every, every startup entrepreneur has to believe that they're going to be successful. I mean, you cannot go in otherwise. And you want to make sure um, that all that effort and all that, you know, um, time, uh, at the end of the day, if you are successful and there is an exit opportunity, you're going to walk away with, with a good chunk of money because you're going to invest your life. You're going to be, you know, heart and soul in the startup. So, um, I made sure that I had a bigger stake, enough that would make a difference. Um, and, so you're uh, talking about an equity position, an equity position of, of a more company. significant size. Yeah, and, uh, and I, then I had a proper contract that sort of spelled out all the legalities of, of working for a startup. And that's important too because it, it's like anything, it's, it's, a, it's an agreement to work for a, a company under certain terms. And you never know what's going to happen, and you want to have that kind of thing in place so that you can protect yourself. So I, 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 I was prepared. I was prepared um, mentally and, and, and in terms of how I approached it from a business perspective. So you weren't such a rookie now. It's your second startup. Sorry. How does it go? Uh, not so good. Um, so um, I, I'm going to be diplomatic. Uh, because Let's just say that... Um, well, you're Canadian, I'm so Canadian, being diplomatic, so be diplomatic is, is yeah. the way to go. So uh, this, this you want to start with, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, yeah. Well, there's two things. One is that, uh, yes, I'm sorry that I went to work for them, but no, I, 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 I didn't see eye to eye uh, philosophically with the CEO. Okay. He wanted to build up the technology platform and spent a lot of money on that, and I really wanted to drive um, marketing and sales. Um, and we had a, a difference of opinion. Uh, uh, the other thing 
um, too, is I was I wasn't ready. Um, How to, what do you mean you weren't? Well, ready? I you know I was a I was a re, I was a reporter. Like despite the fact that I'd done a startup before. So what does it mean to be a reporter? You mean you you, you show up at eight a.m. You leave at four. You work five days a week. What is it? What do you mean be a reporter? Well, I, I knew how to write. I knew how, I knew what a story was. I knew how to write a story. I knew how to interview people. Um, Maybe you could teach me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Use a little help. And, um, and and that's what my that's what my my skill was. Um, but to be a startup um, executive is a completely different skill set. It, it's great that you know how to communicate and write, um, but it doesn't help you um, structure a business, to operate a business, to make the right business decisions. Um, so did you feel you lacked the business acumen? To, in to hindsight, yeah. In hindsight, absolutely. I, I, I found myself in situations where I was, uh, I was in over my head. I knew that I, I knew that I, I, has, I was making, I had the right, um, the right things in mind. I just couldn't figure out how to structure them properly and how to articulate them in a way that business people do. Um, and, uh, and so after nine months, um, I got traded uh, by the VC to another startup called- So that's something that people don't actually realize. People at one startup funded by one venture capitalist right. can be traded. It's not so formal like in baseball, but they, there's, a, there's more fluidity behind the scenes than often people wonder. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, it's not, it's not as simple as sort of walking in one day and we want Mark and off you go to the office mm -hmm. across the street. Um, it was a little more complicated than that. And, um, but they, they, I think um, Rick Siegel um, knew I was in a situation where it was really untenable, but he didn't want me to sort of be out in the street. He knew that I, yeah, you can have two great assets that just aren't on the same page. Right. There's nothing wrong with either one of them. No, and he and he wanted he he wanted to leverage me, and there was an opportunity in another company, and it all worked out. Um, so nine months into B five Media, your second go, you leave for Planet Eye. Right. And how was that? Was that was the third time the charm? So that was that was a great experience. Planet Eye, the the business, which it did online travel planning. It was um, technology that came out of Microsoft, okay. and Rick Siegel had seen the technology, got very excited about it, and it was all about putting data on maps. And today, we look at Google Maps and think, well, data on maps, no big deal, Makes right? Sense, yeah. At the time, uh, it was a big deal, and it was pretty interesting technology. Uh, the business didn't get, go anywhere because uh, the travel business is, online travel business is extremely competitive, and we just couldn't capture enough users to get any business traction. Um, that was the downside. The upside was I, I, um, I worked with, um, with the CEO, um, Butch Langwa, who was really super transparent in terms of how he ran the business. So how he hired, how he fired, how he financed, how he made partnership decisions. Um, was this the missing business acumen that you wanted? Was this the sort of, right. I was uncomfortable in the second gig, I wanted more business, now transparently the CEO right. will share this. So this was kind of like going to business, like getting your MBA and specializing in, in, in startup entrepreneurship. Which was really good at Ryerson University. It is really good. I wish I had gone to Ryerson beforehand, I, actually. I, I'm be also a graduate of Carleton, and I also wish I went to Ryerson before. So um, it was really, it was super educational. Um, and I really, and that was what took me from being a reporter uh, who worked for startups into a, a, a person who actually was a startup executive and actually got some real experience about how to run a startup. If you had to say one or two points to contrast the two. Right. So Mark the reporter at a big brand that, that opens doors and Mark the startup entrepreneur. Pros and cons now that you've, you've got a little time thinking about both? Uh, well, reporter was good communication skills, um, the ability to, to find a story and to, and to do good research. And the executive was um, the ability to see the big picture and understand that, that startups, um, there's lots of different angles to running a startup. There's the business side, the communication side, the sales side, the marketing side. And, and so what I learned was almost got a, a, a much better view of how all those worked and how they work together. How all the pieces of the founder team kind of fit. Right, and, and, um, and I guess that maybe, this, you know, I guess the, one of the, um, the other things that sort of the common denominator between the two is people skills. When you're a reporter, or at least the way that I worked, it was all about people skills and making, establishing relationships and, and getting people to tell you things that they shouldn't really tell you, but they liked you, so they told you anyway. And, and then when you work for a startup, it is all about, a lot of it is about people skills, getting people to work really hard. Getting people to accept a product that may not be perfect, but you need their input, you need to get them to try it. For right. Minimum, yeah. And getting people to work long hours, um, often for not a lot of money, um, but making them feel like they're part of a team and part of something bigger. 
um, and they're really building something that's significant and, and, and interesting. I'm fascinated by becoming the entrepreneur. So you go to journalism school, that's your goal, you, you work in the field. It has a very, at that time, a very specific career path. Right. And before bloggers, before the Huffington Post, it had a very specific career path. And then you find yourself as an entrepreneur with different hours, some flexibility in other, one area, other flexibility in others. What was that like when you had to look back and say, I went to school for four years, and I worked as a reporter, and now I have this different lifestyle? How would you compare the two? Well, I mean, being a reporter is very structured. I mean, especially when you're a business reporter. Remember, um, you know, if you're, we work nine to five, Monday to Friday, around the markets. But if you're a news reporter or a sports reporter, your hours are crazy. Like you're working sure. day or night or weekends. So I had a different type of job because I had a very much of a nine to five job, which was great. Um, great for your social life and great for your family life. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about family life and social life actually, balance because I, I know that's important to you. Yeah. When did you first think you were an entrepreneur? Like when did you say, oh, I can't say it anymore. I'm no longer. I'm part right. of the clan. I've, I've bought in. I'm part of the dark side. I'm all down. Right. So, um, so it was, it's, it's actually a pretty telling moment because I had, I had, got, I had been laid off by Planet Eye. Okay. Uh, this was 2008. The, the credit crunch was in. It was like basically it was, we were on the verge of the Great Depression, or Absolutely. that's what everybody thought. Uh, and I, I got a three-month severance package, which was, it is unheard of if you work for a startup. It doesn't really happen yeah, that often. Yeah, no severance. Uh, we, had been, we were well-funded, and this happened to be in my, in my package. And so uh, I, was, um, I had got some contract work sort of to extend the runway out. So yeah. I, I looked at it this way. I had three months, and if I got a contract, it was now three and a half months. And I, and I, I said to my wife, I said, listen, you know, if I had gotten a six-month severance package rather than three months, I'd definitely do this entrepreneurship. I would, I would start my own consulting company. And she looked at me and she said, well, why don't you make the three months last for six months? And I went, huh, okay, <laughs> that makes sense. And that's the moment where I figured, you know, I'm going to go for it. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my own thing. I'm not going to go work for a startup. I'm not going to go back to a newspaper. Um, and I'm going to take a shot at, at building this consulting business. Why do you think so many people are afraid to take that shot? You know, Wayne Gretzky's famous for saying you always miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Right. Yet many people have these entrepreneurial dreams and don't take them. Uh, I think it's the fear of the unknown. Um, I think a lot of people are, uh, are scared of, of what's around the corner and they get, people get comfortable or they think they're comfortable in their situations. And um, and I think it stops them from doing things that are probably good for them or things they should do. It's like, um, it's like when you go up to the cottage and you're on the dock and you're on the edge of the dock and you think to yourself, man, the water looks really cold. I, I don't want to go in. And someone comes up behind you and they kind of just nudge you with your fingers like that and you fall into the water. And at first it's really shocking. And you're going, you're thinking that person, I can't believe they did that. And then you, you know, and then, so, sort of like that. And then get out of the water, you have then, that little refreshing No, moment. but then you get in the water and then you start swimming around, right? Yeah. And then it gets a little warmer and it gets a little warmer. And then after a while, you're really comfortable and you're going, well, I'm glad they pushed me in because it's, it's great in here. And then you don't come out for a while, right? So when did you start being comfortable with being an entrepreneur? When did that cold turn to warm? Well, probably, uh, probably, it probably took um, a, about, the f about a year to do it. So it, after the, like, I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of businesses, it's the first year is often the hardest because you either sink or swim and you're going to find out pretty quickly whether what you're selling or what you're developing has a market or not. And so after the first year, I realized that, hey, I, I, I did it. I, I actually got business. I made pretty good money. I put food in the table. This is going to work. Um, but until then, um, you're not quite sure. Um, and even to this day, I, I still, I still um, have this, um, this approach of healthy paranoia. Because you're never, you can never, as an entrepreneur, you can never rest on your loyals. You know, what you do in the past is, is not indicative of what's going to happen in the future. Um, so you've had great clients in the past or you've signed up great customers. It doesn't mean that they'll come, continue to do business with you or you'll get new ones. So you're always working and working the angles and looking for new opportunities and looking for new ways to, you know, change the business, adapt the business. Uh, now you've done that. You've found a way to have your cake and eat it too, if I may. You write great stories for Forbes on a blog. I've read your, your blog on Canadian startups, the newsletter. Right. You still get to do that, but you do a lot of advisory work for startups. So you still get to sort of, I wouldn't say take the equity, but, but to have more upside, to have more flexibility, to have that novelty. Right. What advice do you find yourself giving clients today, having been in their spot, trying to get stories published, trying to get people to pay attention to them? 
Uh, I, I just, I think fundamentally it's all about good stories. Like I describe myself in many different ways, but I think when it comes to, to a common denominator for what I do, it's all about, I'm a, I'm a storyteller. And so I'm a storyteller when I write a blog post or a, a column, and I'm a storyteller when I, when I work for a company and I do their core messaging or I do their marketing strategy or I, I create pitches. And good, people like good stories. I mean, storytelling has been around for, you know, hundreds if not thousands of years. and. And even to this day, we like a good story. And if it's a startup telling us a good story about why they created this product and how this product is going to make them, you know, more productive, more efficient, happier, richer, thinner, whatever they want to be, people, that's what connect, people will connect to that story. Um, so my biggest advice to, to startups is, is build stories around your products and, and your services and, and, and think about your target audiences and, and what, how you could get them interested. And it may be a matter of, of simply uh, of, of doing the mother test, is telling a story to your mother about the product you're making. And if she's interested, and my mother's a Luddite, so this is a pretty good litmus test. So mine will just fall asleep. It yeah, so. I'll get halfway through a story and be like, okay. But if they're interested, you know, then, you've got, then you're on to something. Then you, then if, you can, if their eyes don't glaze over after the first 30 seconds, then maybe you've got something that's interesting. That's a good story. I want to talk about how social media has changed storytelling. Right. You know, once upon a time, you wrote a story, you had an editor, you, you had a fact checker, uh, there was 24 hours at least between stories. Uh, that's changed in the last 10 years. How have you seen it change and how has it impacted the art of storytelling social media? Well, uh, well it's, it's done two things. One, it's, it's lowered the barriers to entry and it's democratized the whole uh, storytelling. So now anyone can put out a story. Yeah, anyone can, anyone can be, uh, anyone who's can put out a story, and the people who are good at telling stories have lots of different platforms to tell them. So they can tell them on a blog or, or on a YouTube video, or they can do a great um, webinar or a podcast, uh, or even on Twitter, you know, despite the fact that you've only got 140 characters. But um, that's what's really sort of, I think, changed everything um, for people like myself and for startup entrepreneurs is that that there's lots of different places that you That's can do a double-edged sword. If you lower that, 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 if you lower that, that, that bar mm -hmm. so everybody can put out their opinion, then you have a whole signal-to-noise issue. Right. When I read your piece in the Globe and Mail, no matter what I thought of the piece, I knew it had a certain standard of journalistic quality, I knew it had been researched, and I knew you could be held accountable to your words. But I don't know that that's always true in social media, and I wonder how that changes the story. Well, I think we're going through, I mean, we've, we've gone through this love affair with social media where everybody is climbing on the bandwagon, and now social media is table stakes. I mean, we're all on Twitter and we're all on Facebook. Um, it's assumed. It's, it's like having a website. Once yeah. upon a time, it was a luxury. Now, how could you not? Right. And so, it's, and so, the, so in, one, in some sense, the playing field is level because everybody has the same weapons and their communications are arsenal. Um, and I think it's making it increasingly difficult for anybody to capture the, capture the spotlight. And I think it's put more pressure than ever on, on the ability to be creative and to tell a good story and to think outside of the box and to do things that are more interesting, more insightful, more entertaining and more engaging. So because there's more people doing it, there's more noise, you have to make your signal even stronger, more creative, the hook even better. Right. And I think one of the, one of the keys that, um, that a lot of companies need to remember is that social media is not a, a, a quantity game. It's not how many tweets you put out or how many platforms you're on. It's how well you leverage the platforms that you're on and how, how you can connect with your tar target audiences. So if you decide, for example, I'm only going to be on Twitter and we're going to do an awesome job doing multiple things on Twitter, then, hey, that's great. And do your thing. Um, but if do you, you just, think that should be a bandwidth decision? I only have so much time in the day? Or should that be an audience decision? Who I'm want my story to be heard by uses Twitter as opposed to Facebook or it's, the newspaper. It's probably both, but I think that, I think that has, has more to do with your audiences than, than anything else. Because you got you got a party where the party's happening, and so you, you want to basically focus your efforts on where your consumers are, are getting their information and how you want to engage them and where you want to engage them. Um, and I think that, you know, by being focused and, and taking your target audiences into mind, you can do a much better job of serving them. And then they'll get more value out of it, and then they'll stick around longer. Um, they'll see it as a trusted uh, and valuable resource, as opposed to you're trying to do everything to, to basically get as wide a base as possible. I want to, I've always enjoyed your advice, and I've always enjoyed uh, reading your, your material. I wonder what advice you can offer our students. 
So two questions. First, you found your passion. It's very evident when you talk about how much you enjoy what you do, when you read your blogs, you see it. So how can they find their passion is my first piece of advice I'd love to hear. Uh, I just think you have to sort of, I mean, not to say that you can suddenly discover it one day, it's gonna, it's, it's, it's gonna land in your lap, but I, I, and sometimes it takes you a while to, to, to get from point A to point C. You have to go through point B, and sometimes point B isn't such a good experience or it's not what you expect it to be. Um, but I think you just have to sort of um, be committed to doing the things that, that you're, you love to do or the things that you're really passionate about. Um, and, and especially for young entrepreneurs, is just go for it. I mean, you know, if you're not married and you don't have kids and you don't have a house, the downside of, of working for a startup and it not working out is about this much. I mean, you're... You, you can have, always sleep on your parents' couch. Yeah, you have so much, um, so much uh, appetite and, and for risk um, and th your risk threshold is so high um, that do whatever interests you and what are you, whatever you find interesting and, and what you'll find is the experience will be invaluable. Um, it's when you have kids and you have a mortgage and you know, and you have responsibilities is that your risk threshold gets really low and you can't do the, even, you can't, you, even if you want to do the things that interest you, you don't because you're stuck, right? Because I'm stuck in that job because it has benefits and, re, and a retirement plan and even if I want to do that, I, I'm stuck here. So number one is, is just, you know, throw caution to the wind and, and see what happens. I mean, there's, not, there's nothing lost by, by uh, pursuing that kind of thing. So that's a great piece of advice. The second piece of advice I, I want to sh have you share is you do have a wife and you do have kids, and you manage to be perceived, at least, at getting a lot of things done simultaneous, having a lot of balls in the air. How do you find the balance? The balance between family and work? Uh, it's a constant struggle. Uh, I think for a lot of entrepreneurs that have families, I think it's, it's you have to be passionate about both, and, and sometimes um, work kind of wins out over family, and sometimes family wins out over work. Um, but I think, you, I think one of the things is that you have to separate church and state, and you have to understand that there's only so much time that you can devote to work, and there's only so much time that you have for family. And you gotta figure out in your own mind what, that, what the right balance is. Um, I mean, for me, one of the decisions uh, about being an entrepreneur and not working in a cubicle, um, uh, you know, having to go to work you know, 8 o'clock every day and come back at 6, is I wanted the, I wanted the work-life flexibility. So I work really hard. I work a lot harder than I did when I was a reporter. I work a lot harder than I did when I worked for startups. But it's on my terms, uh, mostly on my terms. Um, although your, your clients do sort of tell you what to do. And your wife might. And your wife tells you what to, to do, of course. Too. Um, but, but at least if I decide that I'm not working on Friday, I don't work on Friday. Or if my daughter has a soccer game, then I go to the soccer game and I do the things that are important to me. Um, but I think that, you know, even for young entrepreneurs, you know, it's, it's work-life balance is really important because your friends, you know, the friends that you make when you're young are the friends you could have the rest of your life. And, and it's important to, to, uh, to enjoy your friends and develop a big real-life network as opposed to a digital network um, and make that, that part of your life as, as, as interesting and as, um, and as active and as stimulating as, as working for a startup. You know, when, when we went to Carlton, the, the Facebook of our day was the pub. Right. You would go and you'd, you'd talk to your friends, you'd play sure. euchre, you, you, would, you, would, you would sort of connect, and now it's really made a big shift. Yes and no. I mean, I, I think that, um, I mean, I think that uh, younger people have, have lots of different ways of communicating with each other, but I don't think they're any less social. Uh, or I don't think they've become digital hermits where they just communicate by Facebook. I think, you know, there's just as... They, you know, innately as human beings, we have a need to be analog and to hang out with each other and to do things together. To bond, to connect to the community. Exactly. And I, th man, I, I would stress so that, that what I have found in, as I have become more and more of an entrepreneur is my, my personal network um, has become so valuable in terms of new opportunities, new career opportunities, new business opportunities, new personal opportunities. Um, and, I, and, I, and I tap it all the time. Um, and so what I would say to a lot of younger people is build those networks, you know, build your personal networks, build your professional networks, because at the end of the day, they're, they're great investments. Well, you've been a great investment, and I very much enjoyed having a chat with you. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mark Evans. Thank you so much. That was great. We'll be right back with some commercials, and we'll be right back with some questions.
Welcome back to The Naked Entrepreneur. Today we're sitting down and talking to Mark Evans. Next up, student questions. Hello Mark, hello Professor Wise, thank you for a great talk. Uh, my question is about pitching. Uh, I found it really insightful um, for you to say, you know, pitching could be uh, the same as storytelling. But I'm interested to know uh, what your perspective is on how you differentiate a pitch to a customer versus a pitch to an investor. Uh, good question. Uh, in some ways, uh, they're the same but different. So I think that one of the things that startups need to have is, is really solid core messaging about who they are, how, what they do, how they're different or how they're unique and the value that they provide to their different stakeholders or different target audiences. Um, and what you, with that, what you do is you, you tell those stories to different p types of people and it's, it's the same story but it's variations on a theme. So the story that you would tell to a customer about the benefits of your product or the, the value props of your product um, would be tailored to their specific needs and interests. And, that, and then the story that you would tell a potential investor would be tailored to their specific needs and interests. But you're telling them sort of the same things, uh, but with, you're emphasizing some things more than others. And so it's, it's, it really comes down to the, having that core uh, and then being able to sort of tweak it as you go. Great question. Thanks very much. Uh, my question is, when you left Planet Eye and started your own consulting firm, who was your target market in terms of clientele and how did you go about getting them? Uh, so uh, that's an interesting story because uh, what you do when you lose your job these days is you, instead of hiding in the basement, you tell the whole world that you've lost your job. And so I was on Facebook and had done that and got a call from a uh, video game maker asking if I was interested in helping them create a strategic marketing plan. And I said yes, even though I'd never played video games, I'd never done a strategic marketing plan in my life. I figured I'd just bluff it and see. Um, and so I, didn't, I really didn't know what I was gonna do. Um, and it really came down to what people needed me to do, which was a lot of social media strategy and tactics. So I did that for a couple of years. Uh, and then the market and my interest led me in another direction, which was towards startup marketing. I just felt that uh, social media uh, strategy was getting a lot more competitive. It was hard to differentiate myself. It really wasn't where my interests um, were anymore. Um, I just felt it, was, it just wasn't as stimulating as, as, as it once was. Uh, and then I started to get approached more by startups. So actually startups, the inbound led me in a new direction. And I think that's one of the things about being an entrepreneur is you, you really don't in some ways, you, you, your path isn't really, you don't carve your own path. It's, it's sometimes the path is carved for you or you get pushed in different directions that you never expected to go. So if you had told me two years ago that I'd be focused on startup marketing, I would have said, well, you're crazy because there's no business there, but here I am. Thank you. What do you think the key to startup marketing is today? I, well, I think that um, is that startups have uh, a lot of needs. And that's one of the, the things that's really interesting about working with them as opposed to simply doing social media strategy, which is a very singular kind of activity. And so what I think that what you do as a startup marketer is you, you do sort of develop messaging and strategies and stories, but in a sense you're helping them with everything. Like I find myself having them with branding and, and website um, usability and business development and looking for investors. So it's I personally, from what I do, it's, it's, it's multifaceted. Well, that must be one of the upsides, but what about the downside? What about the high mortality rate in your clients? Well, that's, you want all your, your clients to be successful, but the reality is, is that, I think, what is it that, uh, that one, in, one in four VC startups, back startups make it? Um, so most of, the start, most of the clients I work for are going to fail. And well, one in four survive. One in four survive, yeah. But most, so most of my clients are, three quarters of my clients are probably going to fail. Uh, well, hopefully I'd help them so much they won't fail. But um, it, it, I think one of the frustrating things is that you provide them with these, these services and you do your very best to help them. But for a variety of reasons, they don't make it. Their product doesn't resonate. They, they, don't, they can't execute, which is a huge thing when it comes to startups. And it's not enough just to have a good idea. You have to actually be able to fulfill products and orders. The product has got to meet um, a market need, and your marketing has got to connect and hit people at the right time at the right place, and your sales team has to basically sell effectively. And so you can do all this work for them, and they still won't make it. Um, and, and I, like, I, I generally like, really like the people that I work with. I, I, I mean, I, I like entrepreneurs in general. I like their, their, 
their enthusiasm and their passion, uh, but even the people that you really, really like aren't going aren't to be successful, and that's great. disappointing. Great question and great answer. Thanks very much. Hello, Mark. I have a two-part question as well. Uh, first part is, did you have any mentors for both working as a reporter and as you started out as an entrepreneur? Uh, so as a reporter, uh, so when I was, uh, when I worked for the Financial Post originally, uh, I mean, I was 24, I'd been a sports reporter for two years, um, pretty green behind the ears. I could write about junior C hockey and girls high school basketball, but I didn't know anything about business reporting. Uh, and there was a guy named Bernard Simon who was a veteran editor and did a lot of, um, spent a lot of time sort of nurturing and guiding and making my stories sort of look like they were really well written. So that was important. And then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, when I was at Planet I, uh, Butch Langwa, the CEO, um, became a mentor. I don't think he saw himself as a mentor. Maybe at the time I didn't see him as a mentor, but he was somebody who sort of really um, provided me with, with a, real, a real valuable education in terms of how you run a startup. Um, and maybe it was just his operating style that made, him, um, made me think of him that way. Um, but probably, uh, I would see him as probably a, a pretty valuable piece uh, along the way. And so okay. let me just ask on that point, uh, how do you best work with mentors? Um, I think you have to find the right mentor, uh, the, the one that sort of um, fits your entrepreneurial needs, your entrepreneurial style, um, and, and your personal style. Um, somebody who can provide both strategic and, and valuable counsel and context. Um, and the other thing too is to, is, is if you can find that person, is to, um, is to listen as much as you talk um, and to accept the fact that, that what they've got on you, despite the fact that you might be really smart, um, is they've got experience and they've got perspective. Um, and those are two things that you're never gonna get um, without putting in more time. And so if you can glean from those two things um, and you can sort of ask the right questions and help and allow yourself to be guided and steered in different directions, then you'll have a successful mentor-mentee relationship. So ask yourself, allow yourself to be guided, ask the right questions, sort of be open to it. Right. That's great. And I think you had a second part. Uh, yeah, how do you go about finding a qualified a candidate to be a mentor in terms of for life or business, entrepreneur, uh, venture side. And so, so I, I mean, I think that you have to be uh, you have to be uh, ready to uh, to be mentored. I think you have to sort of come to a time where you recognize that you pr you need some guidance and you you want somebody to provide you with some uh, sense of where to go and what to do. Uh, and then it, I think it's just a matter of, of of networking, either proactively or sort of doing it. Um, you know, sort of asking people within your network about who might be a good mentor. Um, I, you know, it's interesting that I think that mentor, mentorship and mentoring has become increasingly popular and, and increasingly attractive to a lot of people who, who have a lot of experience but want to share it in different ways. Um, and so I think that, that there's a lot more possibilities um, these days and, and I think it's just a matter of making yourself public and you're interested in a mentor and you'll be, I think you'd be surprised by how many people are actually who, who want to get engaged. So step one, put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. Let people know you're looking for a mentor and maybe they'll present themselves. Right. And step two, maybe listen more than we talk as my mother likes to say, you know, you have two ears and one mouth. Right. You should use the ratio. Yeah, and I think that, I, I mean, I think that, not to say that you'll find a mentor right away, um, but eventually you'll, you'll meet somebody who may, you may not even recognize that they're a mentor at the time. And the, the more time you spend with them, and that you'll sort of, they'll sort of fall into that role. Maybe, and maybe you won't even both realize it. Maybe we'll just be friends. But this friend will be a really somebody who really provides good counsel and advice. And there you go. It just sort of falls in your lap. Thank and, you. And providing good counsel and advice is something you've done here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Mark Evans. <laughs> we'll be right back after this. Some ideas are hot, some ideas are not. This is a hot idea. Twitter, using 148 characters to instantly digitally connect with anyone in the real world. This is not. Jersey Shore, eight characters, not connected to anything real in the world. This is a hot idea. Facebook, efficiently sharing social news with your friends. This is not. 
using Facebook to show how drunk you were at the office party. This is a hot idea. Post in your unwanted goods to Craigslist, the world's home of free classified ads. This is not. Post in your sister to Craigslist. Friends don't let friends pursue bad ideas. Find out if your idea is hot or not. Our guest tonight was Mark Evans, the voice of Canadian startups. Mark shared with us everything from finding a mentor to how to pitch for better media. Thanks very much for watching. From Ryerson University, I'm Sean Wise, and this has been The Naked Entrepreneur.